I'm here with um, Partners with Ethical Care Talks, and today we're with Coach Linda Blade, who's from Canada. And um, Coach Blade, you have some really important insights about what's happening and the erosion mm -hmm. of women's sports and really the erasure of girls and women's safe spaces. I was wondering if you mm -hmm. could just sort of give us some background on how you got involved with this. I know that you have um, you were involved initially a long time mm -hmm. ago with assessment of mm -hmm. doping schemes, which is sort yeah. of how you how you got into sort of policy regarding mm -hmm. um, sports. And if you can just talk about what's happening in Canada. Well, um, you know, I've been an athlete coach most of my life, and I hadn't paid much attention to women's issues or social issues, whatever. Uh, I thought I was going to be a university professor, but it turned out that I basically just became, had a private business coaching athletes in many different sports uh, and private sport performance consulting. And then around 2014, I became the president of Athletics Alberta, which is our provincial governing body for track and field, because I was a track athlete. I benefited from Title IX. I have a huge background in track and field. And actually, I would say that my PhD in kinesiology back in the 90s and that I got in the 90s and then with sports sciences and then also my background track and field um, gives me the perfect uh, set of tools to actually help athletes in every sport. Because like if you're a hockey player, for example, professional beginner doesn't matter. If you need to run uh, skate faster, <clears throat> if I teach you how to run faster on dry land and get the hips moving like faster, like with the coordination, you actually skate faster. So track and field is actually the foundation of all the other sports, which is why it's the, the sort of the foundational sport of the Olympic Games. So I'm just giving you the why I'm working with athletes in 17 different sports. Um, and, so and for those who don't know what higher. Title IX is, um, can you explain how important yeah. Title IX is? Because you, so, like many women, were able to go to college and got scholarships mm -hmm. as a result of Title IX. Yes. So the Title IX, the importance of Title IX is that um, before 1972 uh, in the U.S., um, women had no opportunities in colleges and universities to actually play sport on a scholarship. In fact, it was, you know, men usually got... <clears throat> the scholarship offers and the, their school paid for and women usually just did sort of the recreational sport but had to pay for their own for themselves and um, there were many situations like for example in, in uh, high schools back in the 60s and 70s there was a lot more money even given to the high schools for men's sport boys sports but when girls sports were not just they were just sort of considered recreational and so when title IX came in it was basically a U.S. law that said that any publicly funded um, institution that had sports in it, whether it was high school, university, had to give equal amounts of resources to the women and the men, and so males and females. So basically, I had come back, see, I grew up in South America, but when I came back from Bolivia in 1978, um, I graduated from high school in 1980, I remember my coach telling me, well, you can get a scholarship now. And so that was, you know, I, I decided, I mean, it was, it changed my whole life because even when you're in a high school, you have a decision. Are you going to train hard through your sport or are you going to work at McDonald's and raise money to go to university? And I remember making a conscious decision two years out that I was going to try for a university scholarship and I would train really hard so I could actually get that scholarship instead of you know having to just have a part-time job and forget about sport. So it worked for me. And I got a, a, uh, graduated from University of Maryland, team captain, um, uh, was, I don't know if you remember Jackie joyner Kersey, but I actually competed with her in the heptathlon. Wow. And like we were, I was a top three in the United States in the university division one. So in the and heptathlon- You, you were competing I, against biological women, correct? Yes, yes. And so it was just all women, obviously, in those days. And I mean, I shouldn't say obviously, but it, I mean, we would have never thought that we were going to compete against men. Um, and so, you know, I was very fortunate because, I mean, that set me on a trajectory where I could get my master's degree, I could get my PhD, I could do like train for the Canadian Olympic team um, or national team. I didn't end up making the Olympics, but I made it to a lot of international competitions. I was injured the Olympic year. But part of my frustration with the Olympics is that in those days, there was a lot of doping going on. And so 
I was on the same team as Ben Johnson, you know, the big blow up between Ben Johnson, Carl Lewis um, in the 88 Olympics. And then where Ben Johnson beat Carl Lewis, the American athlete. And then, um, and then Ben got caught with steroids. And, um, and of course, everybody was doing a lot of people were doing it those days. It wasn't just Ben. But anyway, um, in my case, I decided I would not cheat. And it was really frustrating that ha where women would, you know, you'd, you wanted to be higher ranking in the world and you train really hard and you're, I improved maybe let's say a hundred points. And then I see it, see some girls from Eastern Bloc countries who I beat the year before and all of a sudden they improved like 500 points and their voice had dropped an octave. And so I knew that there was a lot of this going on. And, and in those days, Canada thought it was really smart to peg their Olympic standard at the international standard. But the problem was they were, there would be like, they said, you have to be top 15 in the world to get to the Olympic games. But all those top ranking numbers were all from people from the Soviet Union East Bloc who were cheating. So they were setting their standards. So I dealt with the injustice of doping in those days. And so all of, you know, I just kind of gave up after that because I thought this isn't just, and plus I want to get on with my life. So I went and got my PhD, got married to an agronomist, a farmer, a farm guy who grew up on a farm in Alberta and he wanted to do international agriculture. So, you know, all, all this stuff happens and I become president of, of the local track and field. And I have to now, because I'm, I'm one of the only women who is a pres president of, of a Canadian uh, sports association, I have to go to national meetings. And I, on one of the national meetings, I was asked because I was one of the few women to be on a gender committee. This was in 2018, January. And did and you have any idea what that meant at the time? No, I had a suspicion because I kind of had heard some, you know, rumblings before that. But I think I was only like two years before that. I might have been at one conference where they had introduced the sport of Quidditch, which is like the <laughs> Harry Potter sport. And the the lady that had been at our table to share notes on Quidditch said something about like, we don't recognize biological sex. And that was, I thought they were insane. And so, and so I just sort of heard that and toss it off. Like, this is just some wacky thing that like Frisbee or something where people all combine, you know, do a Frisbee league and it doesn't matter. And so I got onto this gender committee and all of a sudden I'm reading the new Canadian policy um that they're recommending to all of the sports associations and it says that people can self-identify into any sport they want with, and they don't have to take have surgery or drugs or, or like anything like just males can be and I right away realized you know obviously with a PhD in human biology I'm like this means that any man could could identify into a woman's sport and so I I look at around the table I say these guys is like there's no way in hell like how in the world what are you talking about? This this means, you know what this means, right? This means that we could let a boy run in a girl's race. And they they kind of look down at their hands and shrug their shoulders. I was so shocked because there's like, instead of agreeing with me, they're like, mm, well, what are we going to do? It's supposed to be policy, you know? And I'm like, hmm, something's not right here. <laughs> and so, And so when I went to see where this was coming from, lo and behold, this ties into the doping. Because lo and behold, the, the association for sort of the entity for the Canadian government that had been created after the Ben Johnson sc scandal in the 80s, like with Carl Lewis and Ben, there was a thing called Canadian Center for Ethics and Sport. And they were the, um, the key bureaucratic entity that was supposed to be ensuring that Canadian sports don't cheat. So they were, they're responsible for all the doping controls and everything. And this was the entity that was saying, we should allow um, self ID, but like so. For, based on from, that, based on the whole self ID thing, what is the point yeah. of having um, men's and women's sports anymore? Well, that's what I would ask. Um, I, I'm still at that point where I'm trying to ask them. I'm engaging in with them in correspondence, and all I get is this: "You're exaggerating. Um, you you need to." we're doing we're instituting this policy to make things uh more you know safe and equitable and i'm like no 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 you safe know yourself equitable <laughs> yeah no. it's not safe it's no. not safe especially in contact sports it's not equitable and now the guy 
after World Rugby, I, I'm I'm zooming ahead here, but World Rugby finally this year finally was the first sport, and I missed a step because what I'll say is this: I'll go to World Rugby in a minute. But the other thing that happened was after I realized how stupid our uh, Canadian sport bureaucracy was becoming, I thought, well, surely the Olympics that if they listen to the Olympic International Olympic Committee, they would know that this is like a clear, what are the categories, right? So I go and <laughs> look up the, I go and look up the International Olympic Committee transgender policy and whoops, there it is again. It's like, you're allowed to self ID, you're, you're, um, you know, like you could, in that case, you had to take, you had to live as a woman for a year, like whatever that means. What does that mean? <laughs> I don't even know what that means. Do they quantify it at all? I mean, that's where I no. get really confused is it seems like this is totally based on somebody's belief system and there isn't yeah. any way to even quantify whether somebody well, really believes they are a woman or if they're just doing this to, to, to like gain an advantage. Not that it really matters because either way they gain an advantage. But I mean, we're back to stereotypes because <laughs> how do you prove you're living mm -hmm. as a woman? What, you wore a wig for a year? Like, what, the, yeah. what does that mean? It's so that insulting. Mean? That's incredibly insulting. It is so insulting. And it's, it's just like, okay, so you live as a woman for a year and then it's up to the person, the, the trans person, to actually go get themselves tested to make sure that they're keeping their their testosterone levels below 10 nanomoles per liter. Like, that's what the IOC says. But the thing is, there's certainly drugs and masking agents where you could take that drug, knowing you're gonna get a test, you can take that drug and within 12 hours, your testosterone drops to a castration level. So, I mean, you can totally cheat and game that system. It's not hard. And so, we know people cheat. I mean, that's the thing is that we know people do. Well, I grew up knowing people cheat. Advantage. Right, exactly. I mean, my whole experience that, in sport is that, that people cheat. The thing that we keep hearing everywhere in sports and school and society is that never happens. You know, oh no, no transgender person would ever do that. And, and we know very well they do, yeah. <laughs> and when I confronted the man, like I called him after, you know, back in 2018 and after that national meeting, and I called the, the director of the Canadian Center for Ethics and Sports, not ethical at all what he's doing, but anyway, the, the center, and I said, you know, Paul, like, you know that, you know, it's five times worse than doping, like doping gives you like a 10% advantage. Being a male in a female sport is, can be up to five times, you know, like five times worse than that can give them a 50%, 100% advantage. You know that from the record books, like it's not, this is not rocket science. Oh, he said, uh, you know, um, basically there's never, he says, well, this is about human rights. It, like they acknowledge that there's a difference, but he says, this is about human rights. And I said, human rights for whom? Like, you're not helping the women. And, and, and he said, well, like he said, there's no, and I said, it's going to be unsafe. I even brought out the thing about like males, for example, in high school and, and girls, if you're on a trip, like to be in the same hotel room and, and like, let's say a parent who self IDs as a woman could be the chaperone for a bunch of girls. And, <clears throat> and, and he goes, oh, you're exaggerating. And he said, besides, he actually made, he actually made the point that never, he literally, I quote him, never in the history of sport has a man impersonated a woman for the advantage in sport. Oh, so this person doesn't watch the news. <laughs> and I'm like, are you freaking kidding me? I mean, I don't know where he's going. Anyway, it's so ideological because he sits in the catbird seat of don't cheat in sport in Canada. Like how, this is so incredibly thinking, like if, if trans people, trans people want to compete, why not have, you know, a, a man wear a woman's swimsuit when he competes yeah. against other men, which is that's where right. he should be competing. I mean, to, to that's what I say all to stereotypes and say that somebody is a woman because of how they dress and how they externally present is so yeah. regressive. And it's also it's, so insulting to women. It's, it's insulting. It's incredibly insulting. It's like making our sport into a clown show. I right. mean, seriously. It, yeah, it really is. And then also we, we, we see this all, I, I find this all kind of very um, like colonization. People yeah. will always be telling you um, like, uh, 
for example, when you use the example of like prostitution, there's always a hundred of people telling you, no, there's lots of women that really love prostitution and da, 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 da. And we have the same that's going on with sport. So we have Rachel McKinnon, yeah. who's like posing with the, the, the two uh, females yeah. that he has just, you know, destroyed in a cycling competition. And these women are posing. And I, I can only imagine what they feel inside. They oh, must no, they feel don't like, like they're it. being... They're being used as like puppets. Like all women, all women are totally fine with this. You just aren't. You uh, whatever, whatever. And it's exactly the same tactic that we that, that we see them using with prostitution, with porn, with all of the things that we feel really strongly about. They're always like, you just don't get it. The yeah. the women are fine. They're totally <clears throat> cool with it. And it's like, well, they're not. We're, I mean, we're no, obviously not. They're not fine. cool I mean, with it. It's. Not cool when with it, it right? To, when it comes to standing on the podium with the man who just beat you, I commented to my husband one time seeing this. I said, "Why don't they just refuse to get on the podium?" And he made the point. And Coach Blade, you can tell me if this is correct. He said, "Oh, if they refuse to get up on the podium, they'll never compete again." That's true. That's exactly what would happen. They'd be punished. Mm -hmm. So, it, your your chances of ever doing anything again in sport are gone, and you only have a small window to actually express yourself as an athlete, you know, at your prime. Mm -hmm. So what we can't allow this to be a fight, like we can't rely on the women who are currently competing mm -hmm. to fight this battle. It's the people like me who's ha who've had our turn uh, who have to step up because we benefited. And then of course that brings us to Billie Jean yeah. King. Like people, what do you people think? like Billie Jean King and Rapino and all these people saying, oh, this is fine. Like this is what we should do and this should you know but like these people have benefited to the maximum extent of mm -hmm. our acceptance of women in sports and society and now they're basically throwing away our rights because i think i have to, i'm giving them the benefit of the doubt in a way like i'm i'm thinking well they thought because they were you know gay uh, or i mean sorry lesbians that they think that this is the next human rights step that, you I'm know, not sure people because, used to be... I mean, we, we see Martina Navratilova who yeah. gets up and he says, no, you know, she's probably, I'd say she's maybe even more iconic, um, yeah. you know, uh, yeah. a lesbian than, yeah. so I, I think that actually just, she's gotten really punished from it, but also she's been yeah. pulled up very, very high. Um, yeah. So I, I have to wonder, like, is it, is it just that, you know, you're afraid of being canceled or called names or what is it? Because I don't, I really feel, I really feel to believe that, that Billie Jean King really thinks that, you know, if she was to have competed against Roger Federer, you know, when they were at the same age that it, it just would have, Roger Federer in a wig, there's, nobody would have known how that would have ended. <laughs> so it's, it's but I mean, she ridiculous. beat one man, she beat a middle-aged, she, she beat a, beat a middle-aged. <laughs> mediocre athlete male and right. says that now she's in a position to tell everybody else that we should just go ahead mm -hmm. and open the floodgates and i just feel like i can't believe i i i actually share your i i think the most part of me part of me wants to believe they had their good intention but the biggest part of me says they're just ignoring reality and they're actually probably partly fear but partly there's probably a lot of money at stake and that's what i keep wondering is you know and 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 it's the same thing I can say. I mean, I can't point the finger to, at Billie Jean King without pointing the finger at the Canadian women who are, there's a, an association of, called the Canadian Association for the Advancement of Women in Sport. And about six months after I discovered this thing in my committee, I'm sitting in another national meeting and they bring in the special presentation of this woman from the cause of the Canadian Women for the Advancement of uh, Canadians for the Advancement of Women in Sport, which is now Canadian Women and Sport. They've changed their name in the meantime. But um, anyway, this is the organization that gets a lot of money from the federal government and from who knows where else to promote women's sports and to protect women's sports in Canada. And this lady came in there to arc, like you imagine a room full of um, sport leaders, coaches, people who are professionals as coaches, She's standing at the blackboard doing the gingerbread person or genderbread person. Oh, um, so insulting. It's like we were looking, we were, I was so embarrassed for her. Like, I'm just, like, we're just giggling. Like, we're just like, what are you saying? And so afterwards, she's promoting this thing that 
there's no difference like physiologically there's such an overlap that we should be allowed exactly. to have men in our sport and so everybody's just stunned in stunned silence looking at her and i finally put my hand up from the back of the room and i said well how do you explain the difference in world records because like it's 12 percent or more yeah. you know difference between men and women at every single event in fact for the throwing events I didn't say this part, but for the throwing events, upper body events, it's actually 20 to 50%, you know, difference. And she said, oh, well, you know, 12%, that's just, not, that's <laughs> irrelevant. And you know what, like for, to say that in front of a group of coaches and an mm -hmm. Olympic sort of selection people, where we know that even 1% difference means you don't even make the final, like for her to just right. flip it off and say, Oh, there's only 12%. And it's just, did, I'm curious, how did the other coaches and the other leaders in the room, were you the only one saying, hey, yep. wait a minute, whoa. And, and you know what? We weren't like, as soon as I asked that question, they, they took the people who had brought her in, shuffled her out of the room as fast as they could. Just like what they do with, with Joe Biden, whenever anybody's <laughs> like, let's get them out of there <laughs> because she doesn't know what she's talking about. And um, it was just like people, I think by then there was enough people who are aware in Canada and of course in the leadership roles are, are now frightened enough of this issue, even by that time, by December of 2018, that at the coffee time afterwards, nobody would talk to me. Nobody would talk. It was later yeah. at the dinners that they snuck up to me and said, I really agree with what you said, but you know, I can't say anything. Otherwise I might lose my job. So I had, a lot oh. of people saying that to me. And this is well, we hear the same scary. thing. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, and Alec, we, we hear the same thing. People mm -hmm. will come up and say, thank you so much for what you're doing. I can't put my name out there. I can't, you know, we hear that in every arena of this. Well, yeah, and yeah like, like the birth. Hideous because first mm -hmm. of all, they tell you you're exaggerating. And then they tell, and then, and then everybody stays silent because they're worried about losing their job. And only those of us who are in a position where we don't have to worry about losing our job are able to mm. speak out, which is a tiny minority. It's and a minority. So, and this is just in, incensing me because um, this is teaching girls. This is going to undermine girls' um, mm -hmm. willingness to want to participate in sports at a young age if they feel mm -hmm. already like it's gonna be a co-ed sport and they're not gonna be competing mm -hmm. against other girls. And so I keep coming back to this question, what defines girl sports? Why did we yeah. have Title IX? Why was yeah. it so important that we create Title IX? It was because yeah. people recognized that there are fundamental differences between men and women and women cannot compete competitively against men. Mm -hmm. Well, and, the, and it's just gonna get worse because in order to justify their position, <clears throat> and I'll, I'll pivot to the girls because um, it's important um, that I say this, um, this very, when I see the response to example, I'll just tell you the response to world rugby and then I'll pivot to what it means for the girls. So this year in, in February of 2020, they had finally one world federation of sport, which was rugby decided to do it the right way bring everybody to the table, whether they're trans activists or like women's rights, you know, like fair play for women, Emma Hilton, um, all these people, Ross Tucker, um, all these people who are saying that sports should be segregated on the basis of sex. So they had all these people in the same conference room finally talking to each other. So it's, and I heard, you know, behind the scenes, the Olympic, International Olympic Committee people were freaking out because of course the Olympic Committee I think they know they made a mistake, but they're also scared to death of anything breaking the solidarity with their position. So um, when World Rugby decided to do this independent consultation on the issue, it was going to expose the Olympic Committee because real evidence would come out about women's sports. And so, um, you know, so finally by in October now, two months ago, um, World Rugby, the council because the council is the highest thing they have to approve of what the lower people were you know finding out so the council of world rugby did come out and say that in elite women's rugby only biological females can compete in elite women's rugby which makes perfect sense because they don't they know that the risk of uh, especially in a contact sport like rugby the 
up to 30% more injuries will happen if there's male bodies in female sports. So it's very dangerous and world rugby doesn't want to be responsible for that. But they said, because, you know, tossing a bone to the individual federations at the national level, uh, the unions, the rugby unions in the different countries, they said, well, you can still make up your own mind about whether male can be a women's sport. And so they, they kind of, they kind of didn't put their foot down all the way. They basically said internationally, we're only going to accept females but you can do what you want. And, um, and uh, so, you know, right on cue, Rugby Canada, Australia, USA, Rugby USA, Rugby England, everybody were, all of them were virtue signaling right away and say, we don't agree with world rugby and we're gonna do our own thing. And, you know, I just find that so incredible because even just at that level, I'm getting to the girls, but even at that level, what they don't, they can't possibly abide let's say rugby USA, the minute a girl gets injured or breaks her, you know, goes, gets paralyzed or dies because she's in a collision with a male body. All you have to do to litigate that is to say, you knew the risk. The world rugby told you the risk was there. Like, why did you do this? Why, you know, like the, the exposure to litigation now is huge because the global governing body literally said this is going to be more dangerous. And so you know it. So why? So basically, so Canada, Rugby Canada basically said the same thing as Rugby USA and all these other ones. We don't agree with world rugby and we're going to allow men and women's uh, rugby. And this same guy, Paul, the guy who's in charge of Canadian Center for Ethics and Sport, wrote a letter against world rugby in support of Rugby Canada. And he said that the 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 idea of female, he literally, I have it in writing now. The idea of biological female is obsolete. He literally said that in his letter. And so we now and, have a situation where it's not fair. These competitions are not mm -hmm. fair, but they're also dangerous. And then I also pivot yeah, to- And plus they're stuff. telling girls they don't exist. Right, you're, telling you're telling girls telling their identity that, doesn't- that we, And these girls are going to have to um, share locker room facilities with men. They're going to have to share ac overnight accommodations with men. So on so many levels, this is insidious. And now we have people saying that the idea of biological sex is, what did he say? Obsolete. Obsolete. So we no longer exist as, as females. Mm -hmm. there's, there's we don't exist. We don't exist. And, mm -hmm. and so if there's no such thing, and this is going back to the LGB and, and you know, if, if Billie Jean King is claiming she did it as part of the LGBT movement, um, this is going to take away <laughs> the whole concept of lesbian and, and, mm -hmm. and gay. If there's no mm -hmm. such thing as biological sex, if that's an obsolete yeah. concept, we no longer have homosexuals. No, <laughs> it's actually homophobic because it's yeah. basically saying, if you think you're a sex, you're probably wrong and i mean and so then why again you get back to the thing why do we have these sex categories mm -hmm. so now it appears his position might be like uh, men like the women's sport category is basically the catch-all like whatever you want to be category so we now have and, women's sports and men's sports <laughs> yeah There's and no uh, in his so eyes in his eyes it. that's what he would like to get to and that's why i'm speaking out now because it's not in law yet per se for sport so if i don't push back now if we don't push back now we're, we're we're lost and and i will say we're lost as a whole sport not just for women because at the community level where i work you know you know nationally they pick the olympic team that's basically what they do but each of the provinces or the states we run the sport on the ground like we're the ones who run the competitions we're the ones who bring up the children and and you know it's almost like i don't want to say some people don't like me to use this analogy but i'll call it anyway uh, uh, uh kind of we're the athlete factory like we get the raw materials that come in at, through the entrance we develop them we have the conveyor belt from learning how to train to competing and then we, we bring all their skills together and then it's like the international olympic committee and our national federations are almost like those guys stand fingers crossed standing at the exit door of the factory hoping for a Ferrari to come out so that they can make their money at the Olympic Games or so we're the factory they're the people who take their product and put it on the national stage or the international stage so if inside the factory we have now a policy 
we're not allowed to identify what parts belong where, you know, and, and the fear, like if you're an official and suddenly you see a kid who's identified in another category and you say, well, are you sure you're in, supposed to be in this category You go over here? They could be accused of hate speech because of Bill C-16 or whatever. So what, what's going to happen to the factory? Like all of the people who are volunteers in that system or whatever, there is not going to be anything. Like how can you run a sport? And that's my concern as president of this association is how do we run anything at the ground level um, if we're afraid to, to actually say anything to mm -hmm. keep sport, the integrity of sport the way it is. And I've had parents who tell me they're going to take their daughters and their children out of sport if this is, if the policy mm -hmm. that I was describing to them at the AGM, I described like, I'm probably the only person who's actually been elected on this issue because I had to be reelected as president in 2018. I went to the AGM and explained this policy that I had run into and encountered. And I said, here's what my position is going to be. If you're born male, you compete with them with the boys, no matter how you identify. Right. Mm -hmm. And if you're a girl, you can compete with the either category, but the minute you take hormones, you're doping, you're going to have to go out or you're going to have to go with the boys. So I was very clear that this is what we're going to do in our association. And if you don't like my position, don't vote for me for president. And I have like, I represent 3,500 people. And I had maybe 50 to 100 representatives of those people in that room. And I basically just put it on the line. I said, I, if you don't want your president saying this on Twitter or whatever, because Twitter is my private, but I say a lot of things about the policies and if you don't want your president to represent this point of view, then you shouldn't vote for me. And I had like 96% people vote for me. So I know that I'm not sneaking out. I didn't get elected on some other premise to mm -hmm. sneak into office and then say all these things. I was very honest up front. And that's when I had parents come to me afterwards and say, um, boy, Linda, boy, I just can't believe what you told me. I just can't believe that mm -hmm. this is what's happening and if it happens like that, and if you don't succeed in pushing back and establishing your own policies, if we have to accept this policy from Ottawa, I'm taking my kids out of sport. And that's hard and some of the because sports, yeah. I mean, you know the um, impact sports had on your life. And, and I yeah. hear people who talk about how, um, you know, girls sports change their lives, that, yeah. that being involved in competitive sports change their yeah. lives, that it's a huge thing. Um, and so, so, so it's yeah. just heartbreaking to think change my whole life. It yeah, is my life. Like all that. it changed my life. And so is there, a, is there ever a, a, an opportunity where say someone who is in college identifies as a high school student and is allowed to participate in high school sports? See, that's no. And that's what I keep saying. You, you recognize age. Right. And in which, fact, which is, yeah, you know, I mean, something. our, <laughs> I mean, when our, um, we had a minister, Christy Duncan, Christy J Duncan two years ago, and now she's not Justin Trudeau's minister of sport anymore, but she was Mr. Sport. And she, back in May of 2019, I believe, she literally said, it's not up to sport to say what a woman is. <laughs> and, and I said, I like what a strange thing to say. Well, are you saying it's not up to sport to say what age you are, or like what in the or, world are you talking about? Weight range because there's certain what, what, where you have to be a certain like, weight range. Yeah, like we our job is to ask that question. Our job is to determine what category you are in. Um, that's literally our job. Like you're telling us that's not our job anymore. Then what? What are we? What is sport then to you? Like, you know, we have no sport. That's not that's the point I'm making. Is the entire factory goes away? If you say, like, even World Rugby, if World Rugby will say we will be strict with the sex categories at the elite level, but down here you can do what the hell you want. Um, where do you think they're going to get their women athletes from? Like the athletes don't appear out of nowhere. We are the ones that develop them. We are the ones that bring them through from the beginner to the intermediate to the elite and spit them out the at exit door 
so that all of these people up here can make their big money with the you know tv shows and sport i mean we are the ones that produce these athletes and you're Let saying we can, we can't do it anymore Linda, can I ask a difficult question? Because we're yeah. often, you know, we're we're in, we're the international partners for ethical care. So, you know, because you're from Canada, I, I'd really yeah. love to know what do you what do you think it is about Canada, uh, in particular, that seems to have um, given birth to this degree of lunacy? Because Canada kind of did lead the way in. Yeah. Uh, many of the issues that we at, at Partners for Ethical Care, you know, are very concerned about. So, you know, the prisons, obviously the transing of the kids, they did see, you know, Canada seemed to be really at like the forefront of all of yeah. this. Yeah. What, what do you think? Well, I think Canadians like to be perceived as being nice. Like we, we are the nice people of the world. I mean, mm -hmm. you know, back, I, 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 I had a trip to Iran because for a while I was teaching women how to coach girls in Islamic countries. So I, I had a special dispensation by the IAAF, the International like World Athletics, to be a lecturer. And, and because I was female and I was accomplished in teaching and in sport, they actually had me as the person who would go and speak to Muslim women about how to coach the girls. So I, I was the first Western woman to go into Iran to do one of these courses in 1995. And so I wore a job and everything when it was in public. And then, you know, we'd take off our hijabs when we were private in the gyms and stuff. And, and um, I, the, one of the reasons they picked me was because I was Canadian and that means internationally mm -hmm. non-threatening, right? Um, if I'd had a, a, yeah, if I had an American passport or some other passport, it was, I, I, being Canadian was the least offensive thing you could be. And so it worked out really well for them. So, you know, um, so I know that. I know that the Canadian um, sort of value in the world is to speak on behalf of the oppressed and all these things. But the problem is, it's just like killing you softly because if we take, if we take niceness to the point where, you know, we're being so nice to a small group that we're assuming and, and here's the other thing I don't understand about all of this. I'll say this right off the top. <clears throat> Why is it that as soon as somebody self-identifies as trans, suddenly they became almost become like, almost like angelic beings where they have no failures or faults or, you know, no po possibility of serious sort of danger to other people. Um, I, we're, we're just individuals or we're all human. So it's entirely possible, like when a, when a, obviously if a rapist suddenly says, I'm trans and I want to go into a woman's prison, um, like the, that's, that's the, the nice. self, it's not nice. The self interest, nice this, yeah, the and that's self interest justice. involved in that yeah. man's decision to suddenly decide to take advantage of a situation. Are we so naive that we're not going to see that some of these people? you know, even if there's some legitimate people really think they're trans, I think most of them don't even think that. They're just using it to get into other situations so it gives them an advantage. And why would we think that's not going to happen in sport in other places, but but in prisons and in like in little girls spaces and in women's shelters and, and like that's obviously going to happen. Yeah, obviously I spoke, you're, I spoke to you know, a teacher um, who he's a very outspoken activist for the trans rights agenda. He's a teacher in a neighboring district to mine. And I was speaking with him at a school board meeting. And I said, if we don't have a litmus test for what transgender means, any boy mm -hmm. can get up one day and say, hey, I want to go in the girl's bathroom today and say, I'm going to be transgender exactly. today. This man who's older than I am, I'm in my 50s, he's older than I am, he looked right at me and he said, that never happens. No boy would ever do that. No high school boy would ever do that. And I thought, how long have you been teaching? And, and did you pass educational psychology? They just, they just out and out lie about people. It's, about it's astonishing. Yeah, it is just this astonishing. Is where it really bothers me because it's like we're bending over backwards to be nice to these um, this one very small group, but in the mm -hmm. meantime, we're being we're being very not nice to a whole nother you know to to women who you know 
most, I think all of us probably know how hard women had to fight for, yeah. um, for access to these sports, even for facilities, mm -hmm. even for locker rooms, even for mm -hmm. um, the, the appropriate facilities to do their sports, we had to fight so hard to get those. And this yeah. is, has the potential to take all that away, all that hard work. And so we're gonna be nice to a very small group mm -hmm. who we're assuming has good intentions. As, as you said, I'm not sure that's the yeah. case. And in the but, meantime, we're going to hurt this huge group that has historically had to struggle to be represented in sports and to be safe in spaces. But in Canada, we take it the next step then, because then somebody from the most, you know, the wokest province, which is British Columbia, um, decides to promote, you know, Justin Trudeau comes into office and in whatever it was, I guess, 2015, or I don't remember exactly what year, but anyway, they, he comes in with this whole woke agenda and trying to be so nice and ensconce that in law. And then basically that's where, of course, Bill C-16 came from, which was the one Jordan Peterson was arguing against compelled speech and the pronouns. Mm -hmm. And um, though even just that law, they didn't sort of think through the implications because the, the reason that a prison warden would put a, a male, like a rapist into a woman's cell is to sort of bend the knee to that particular, that's their way of interpreting that particular law. And yet, I'm saying like Bill C-16 to say that you, you know, you can't discriminate on the basis of gender identity, gender expression or gender identity doesn't mean, I mean, it's the people in middle management who are, who are afraid of the woke, who are then making these decisions based on law, using law as their backup, which they could have equally have interpreted it a completely different way to say, if this man is self-identified as a woman he's afraid he's going to get beat up in prison we're going to have a separate wing in the men's prison like the, the law in canada yeah, I mean, what does that even mean to identify as a woman how can you identify yeah, well, I don't even know. As something that you're not i mean yeah. that just that infuriates me and it's as far it, yeah. as i'm concerned instead of putting them in a separate prison block if you've got a man who insists that he identifies as a woman give him a woman's jumpsuit i mean <laughs> That's as but I mean, yeah, a firm, a firm would, identity. Yeah, I mean, but, yeah. but even, even entertain the idea that it's possible for someone to yeah. be something they're not, then we open up this can of worms. Mm -hmm. That that's true. Can. That's true. But anyway, our law allowed people to do it, that because the, it invited people to say what whatever this gender thing means. In fact, when they put when they first were arguing to put Bill sixteen in there. They did make the. They did emphasize that there's a difference between sex and gender. That's how they always start, you know. And they explain sex as your biology and gender is how you behave or work, how you see yourself, whatever your, you know, your your role or the whatever role play. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And so so they start that way, but then they somewhere down the line the sex part drops off and becomes inconvenient. And then now we have this year the newest bill, which the they're ramming through quickly bill c6 which is the gen the conversion therapy bill which says if you interfere you know um this is where it hits the children because if you if a minor is going to identify in a certain way if a parent interferes with that it could be up to five years in pr prison and a huge fine and so now there's you know there's huge risk for any parent who's going to stand away and meanwhile the schools are teaching the SOGI, the, you know, sexual orientation, gender identity, uh, and, and almost every school that's public now is absolutely teaching it. So this is how it happened in Canada. It's coming through the universities and then the, you know, the teachers and the social scientists and all of these people get into these positions of authority within the bureaucracy. And in Canada, because we're so socialized, we have a lot of people on the public dollars like being paid by the public system and they're all in there spreading this ideology around and so you teach it's such a racket I mean honestly I forget who said this but I thought it was brilliant I think I heard it on a podcast with um Artie Morty or somebody but you know every movement you know starts it, it, no it wasn't it was an interview uh with a democrat who was it um Mary Madeline's husband, what's his name? Um, no, like that that couple that that he's a Democrat and she's a Republican. Uh, oh, Kellyanne Conway um, from the Bill Clinton era. I could, that used to be normal. <laughs> um, <laughs> that used to be normal. So, but anyway, he, one he says and one every Republican movement, in the family. Yeah, 
Yeah, um, starts as a, um, what was it? It starts as a movement, becomes a business, and then turns into a racket. And that's exactly what has happened here. It started as a movement, it's become big business, and now it's a racket because the kids ta are taught this philosophy in the schools, and they're even taught, they're even forced to role play now. I've heard from parents in Can Canadian schools where there's like little third graders and stuff the teacher will say, well, this is transgender gay and we're gonna pretend you're the opposite. So they actually role play being the opposite kid and or the opposite sex. And then the kids are so confused. Um, and then, you know, and then as soon as they're, this is what happened with the father in British Columbia. I don't know if you've heard of him, the Hoagland, Robert Hoagland who got arrested um, because he won't confirm uh, affirm his daughter's, you know, um, maleness or whatever. Um, yeah. But anyway, so he only found out the process was role play at school, totally get indoctrinated at school, see the school counselor, school counselor sends you to the gender clinic, the gender clinic affirms that and sends you to the pediatrician to get the testosterone. And you don't even know this is happening until they're almost at the last fifth stage. Well, and, and all like, this can happen without parental consent in Canada, which is mine. Exactly right. And, and so that now... The law they're talking about right now, they're going to vote for it in January, which we have no way of stopping because Trudeau's government has a majority in the in parliament. Mm -hmm. It's going to be Bill C-6 is if you act, if you intervene at all in that process, you're going to be uh, um, basically criminalized. I mean, it's you're outlying. a crime. It's a crime. It's yeah. And, and outlying good parenting. It's outlying truth. Yeah, that's and to what me, it is. it's just that strikes yeah. so close to home because as a kid, I had a trans identity, and thank did goodness yeah. my school counselor did not affirm it. She, you know, she she evaluated me, said Erin wants to be a boy. Let's come up with a plan to help her come. Really, to that. wow. Instead of saying that's yes. amazing. Yeah, and when did you grow out of it? When did you grow out? I probably when I you know started to hit early adolescence, so 12, okay. 13 years old, which is interesting. What we learn that this is yeah. really difficult, and mm -hmm. so it infuriates me that they're now um, that that school psychologist now would be criminalized for having helped me to resolve that, and instead they're putting these kids on a path that is um, medicalizing them, causing them long damage to their bodies. I mean, this, yeah. this is not about health and well-being. This no. is about damage yeah. to children. No, and, and here's the thing. Just and like- Erin like and I, I was Sorry. just gonna say, and Erin and I, unfortunately, we, we see so many girls um, in what we do. We see so many girls that have, um, that have gone through that process of having an identity from sexual abuse. And they, they you know, at the age of 25, when you've had your breasts removed and you have a beard, there isn't, there's there's very little detransitioning to be done. You you can try and reclaim your female body, but that's re reclaiming the identity at that point is almost all you can do. Yeah. Um, and that's what makes us so afraid, terrified, and angry. Quite frankly, um, of course, that, of course. Yeah, and that, you know, that's just like lately. Of course, I've been seeing this a lot on Twitter, but it's something I've known since the '90s. Um, one of the key aspects of going through normal puberty, especially for a girl, is um, is putting money in the bank of your bones and like the, the bone deposits. So basically the way bone density happens, bone, bone mineral density is that um, through that puberty process, you get maybe 30 to 40% of, like a, the bone is a bank account where you keep increasing the density and content of your bones until Everybody increases till about 40, maybe 45. And then we all kind of go, we kind of go downhill from there. And that's why when you get into 90s and you know people break their hip and fall, you, you often hear about an older person who fell and broke their hip. Well, that's not what happened. They broke their hip because of a, a weak bone like snapped right. in their hip. Right. And then and right. then they fell. Mm -hmm. So we end up getting into, you know, eventually, let's say if if I put this um this piece of paper here, let's say that's the level of osteoporosis. So if you've got a huge, huge bone density problem, you know, or a bank account, you're going to go down slowly like everybody else, but, but it, you're only going to get osteoporotic when you're a hundred. But if your bone density is only this high and you're going to go down the same rate, you're going to probably hit osteoporosis by the time maybe you're in thirties or forties. And this is what's going to happen with these girls because 
30% or 40% of that bank account happens during normal puberty. And so if you block that, um, the studies are showing right away, like the, the one study I was looking at. Um, oh, and I, I anyway. did notice that Johanna Olson Kennedy recently published something about the dangers of bone density. And she's one yeah. of the most pro medicalization of kids. She gives um, really puberty blockers to cross to kids at eight years old and cross sex wow. eight years old. She advocates for removing yeah. them at 12 years old, 13 years old. And even her study came out and oh. said that bone density is hugely problematic for these kids. So, mm -hmm. so she's like, so we're going to get a bones. bunch of crumbling bones in oh. the next like 10 to 20 years. They're going to be kids who are going to be osteoporotic, hunched over, bent over, breaking their bones. And, um, that's just, that's just one of so many things as, Al, you know, as you were pointing out, uh, obviously so many things are going to be happening to these people. It's just a catastrophe. And, um, and so, you know, basically what's happened in Canada, like I talked about the athlete factory collapsing where we can't do anything in sport for anybody, whether it's boys or girls. If, if our officials and our people are threatened uh, by, by just doing what we do in sport, why would we volunteer? Why would we coach? Um, but by the same, but even more importantly, now with this B, Bill C6 coming in, I've already talked to one or two um, privately, obviously, um, counselors who deal with children here in the local area where I am in Alberta, who've actually said, I'm not going to take them anymore. I'm just not going to even take them anymore because I don't want to risk um, going to jail or being fined to, to give any kind of consultation to anybody like this. So what Canadian officials, I mean, once again, our legislators don't understand have not explored the implications of ensconcing this in law because as soon as you put this in law people just avoid people just avoid and so these kids are not going to be getting so the only people that are going to be talking to these children are the ones who absolutely affirm mm -hmm. and anybody else who would have been in a position to give them proper guidance and proper consultation and the prop and then the parents the proper sort of idea of what's at stake those people all all disappear from the system that's what you're doing you're just taking them out well we see that already in um in schools here in the united states i've talked to a number of teachers who have just retired early or they've left teaching see? to go to another yep. career because what you're they're doing. Being forced to teach this in the schools and i talked to counselors and therapists who've already said that um, I know one who's a wonderful therapist. She's trying to develop a speaking and writing career in another field because she said, I'm eventually going to lose my license if I continue doing what I do. So it's exactly what's happening. And you know what? <laughs> the only pattern in Canada, because we have socialized medicine and we have socialized compensation, is, of course, the taxpayers, those of us who work and pay our taxes, we're now, we're now compelled to pay for these people's transition because like as like it's all funded pu publicly mm -hmm. and when they go to do their class action suits guess who's going to pay again right. even though yes the harm is mostly them they're the victims not us but at the end of the day we're going to be paying the penalties and the compensation as well mm -hmm. so it's just going to be this big cycle of we pay up front they go through hell and they go through all these awful things happening to them. They, they launch claims and class action 12 years from now, or even within the next decade or, you know, ne decade or two. And then we're going to be paying just like with the smoking or whatever else, we're going to pay the huge bill that, that this created. And meanwhile, we're going to have a bunch of people who are miserable and their lives have been ruined. Um, I can't imagine. So this is what a nice country does. And Canada well, and it's needs not to just up. Canada. The US has been passing um state after state has been passing um bills similar yeah. to the 
C16, is it? The the conversion therapy bans. Yeah. Um, and that's yeah. how I got involved in it is that I read some um, the legislation in my state and realized they were trying to ban the very therapy that helped me. Um, yeah. It just infuriated me. But now we have the Equality Act that is, yeah. um, that, that um, the president-elect <sighs> has said he's going to push through within the first 100 days, which is going to have very similar implications to what's happening in Canada. Um, and and this will be a, a federal federal law now, and it will be really hard to fight back against it once it's um, kind of codified in law. Yeah. In my school district, um, I'm in Virginia in the United States, and um, a lot of uh, pro transgender organizations, um, ally groups, met with state legislators last week to push through the policies that they want in every school district in Virginia. And they requested these, um, these pro-trans ally groups that the state lets them know what school districts refuse to accept the policy so that they can bring to bear pressure on them to make sure that they do. Wow. So this, once again, is just a small minority of vocal activists who are bullying everybody into doing this. And again, just like in sport, just like in the therapy, guess what's going to happen? Parents are going to take their kids out of school. Lots of homeschooling going on. But I did. Yeah. Collapse of the system. Collapse. Collapse of the sport, you know, factory. Collapse of the, the school system. Collapse of, of proper um, co consultation and like the therapies that are available to these children. Um, we're collapsing the social mechanisms that are supposed to be there as safety nets for these people and for these children. And we're removing all of them, but we're not fooling society. Like every time I talk about this on Twitter, like 80% of the people agree with me. Um, it's going to hit the wall soon. I don't know when I hope it, I hope it happens soon. Abigail Schreier's book was amazing um, to open open that up and the fact that it's a bestseller tells you a lot about where people are waking up yeah. um and i almost think that if biden goes ahead and and you know acts on this stupidity um he's going to peak trans a lot of the democrats he's going to peak trans mm -hmm. all of american society i hope it happens quickly before too many people get hurt um and of course if the u.s it's huge, of course, if, if the US would suddenly realize what's going on and, and let's say even most of the voting public or you know, 60 or whatever, 70% or you know, there's always a few that never get engaged in anything. But if the 60% of the people who engage in public life and policy and, and awareness, if those people understand suddenly what's at stake and start pushing back in some sort of a huge way, it's the rest of the world will follow because Canada will just the Canadians will wake up and realize what's going on and say, what about us? Oh, we do that too. Um, and that's why I felt like even with fair play for women, if we get back to the sports, the first group in the UK women are such great warriors and um, fair play for women was like the first, you know, the UK group was the first one that would really came in to argue for the women's sports uh, being sex segregated and, against the trans issue, but then Save Women's Sports started up with Beth, Bell, Beth Stelzer in, in Minnesota. And like that, when that happened, I right away got in touch with her and said, you don't even understand how important you are right now because for something to happen in the US, it's actually gonna be the most powerful thing. And I'm begging you guys, like if the US can actually figure out a way to push back on this policy wise, it's even going to help Canada. It's going to help all of us. We've all just gone demented. And I don't know, like somebody's got to do the big slap across, you know, the face and wake us up. I, I don't know. We need something that will just be really huge. And, you know, it, it was horrifying when I, when I was watching the American, um, when I was watching some of the events in the election process lead up to the election campaigning. And when, when, Biden or who said it was it Elizabeth Warren who said like she was going to put a trans child in charge of the education <laughs> or something like that I mean I was like very insulting very insulting yeah are you 
crazy. Like what is going on, right? What is going on? I think money is what's going on. I mean, to be honest, I I think that Trump would have eventually, you know, bowed down to this very heavy, um, well-organized, well-funded movement as well. Uh, I I think really, I think it's just a matter of time. I think that we we now know that this is a really serious corporate um, behemoth, right? So, you know, there's no, I think that, it, it, certainly it seems that the Democrats are getting a lot more involved and bowing a lot sooner, but I think that everybody would have bowed eventually. Yeah. And then it'll peak trans a lot of Republicans and peak trans a lot of Democrats, and then we'll all have to come together and hopefully assess the damage um, and figure yeah. out how to move forward. And then that, that's why, that's why we're, but well, that's why we exist. That's why Partners right. for Ethical Care exists is because we actually can't, we actually cannot sit back and just say, um, you know what, let's wait until this is all, you know, Hiroshima and we'll, we'll see yeah. how we're going to rebuild. We're like, you know, we're, we're really yeah. going to work on this and that's what you're doing as well. You're like, I'm yeah. not going to wait for a woman to get a skull fracture. Uh, yeah. I'm going to, you know, keep working, keep yeah defending the rights of women not to have men in their sports so yeah, i think it's I so important Thank you so much for doing. your work linda i just really appreciate all that you're doing yeah. here and your willingness to be very public and to hold mm-hmm. office and to and, mm-hmm. to and to stand firm on this yeah. i really appreciate mm-hmm. it thank you well i have a book coming out <laughs> oh well I- yeah. Oh, so plug it. <laughs> and I'll include it in the um in the sure. comments below, but if, or in the description below. But if you want to mm-hmm. do a short plug before we end this, well, book, I it, I can't show you the cover yet because we're still working on it. But um, it's 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 finished. I finished writing it. It's with the publisher. It's with Rebel Media. Um, and I co co-authored. Well, I not she doesn't want to be called co-author. She helped me with the editing, but it's Barbara K. So Linda Blade and Barbara K um and it's probably going to come out within the next maybe two months and um it's uh it's called unsporting Mm. how trans activism and and science denial are destroying sport oh i can't wait to read that yeah i am looking forward to it and i will update mm -hmm. this as soon as it's out so if so if you send me a link and and i will update this with a link to it um sure published so I just take people through what's happened and finishing off with, we got a letter now, like we did a petition through Save Women's Sports, begging the IOC to suspend its policy from 2015, like the one that they didn't think it through, the self-ID policy. And we got to thank God, like we did get a response finally um, from them. And they said, no, it's, we, we, we realized this is a problem. We're going to have to try to adjust uh, some sort of balancing of rights but we can't change anything before the fall, the next Olympic games. So, well, um, we're going to keep fighting. We'll, well, thank you yeah. so much. Yeah. yeah. Let's keep fighting. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> well, it's great chatting with you ladies and I'm, you know, let me say thank you. Thank you for your organization because um, I think we need you desperately and we, we need you to have a larger and louder um, voice as you go along going to become more and more important to inform the American public or everybody really on on what's going on and how to protect our children I mean because this is really the, the children I mean sport is one thing but you know honestly children is like what's happening with the kids and, and the next generation is is probably it's way way more important way more important it's the most important thing yeah. and so I, I do really appreciate and I, I love the fact that you're so you know nonpartisan um this can't be one political party versus another this and it can't be one religion versus another and it can't be you know intersectional feminist versus radical feminist it's it's got to be everybody this is a human issue this is a human so foundational to who we are it is not the purview of any one group and i i really appreciate so much your stance 